I call upon the Chief Prosecutor for the United Kingdom of Great Britain. Hunger and disease stalking through the world. Millions of people, homeless, maimed, bereaved, and in their graves, crying out not for vengeance, but that this shall not happen again. Ten million who might be living in peace and happiness at this hour. Soldiers, sailors, airmen and civilians killed in battles that ought never to have been fought. Nor was that on the only or the greatest crime. In all our countries, when perhaps in the heat of passion or for other motives which impair restraint, some individual is killed, the murder becomes a sensation. Our compassion is aroused. Nor do we rest until the criminal is punished and the rule of law is vindicated. Shall we do less when not one, but on the lowest computation, 12 million men, women and children are done to death, not in battle, not in passion, but in the cold, calculated, deliberate attempt to destroy nations and races, to disintegrate the traditions, the institutions, and the very existence of free and ancient states. Twelve million murders. Two-thirds of the Jews in Europe exterminated. More than six million of them on the killer's own figures. Murder conducted like some mass production industry in the gas chambers and the ovens of Auschwitz, Dachau, Treblinka, Buchenwald, Marthausen, Maidenek, and Oranienburg. And is the world also to overlook the revival of slavery in Europe? Slavery on a scale which involved seven million men, women, and children, taken from their homes, treated as beasts, starved, beaten and murdered. It may be that the guilt of Germany will not be erased, for the people of Germany share in it in large measure. But it was these men who, with a handful of others, brought that guilt upon Germany and perverted the German people. It is my guilt, confessed the defendant Scharach, that I educated the German youth for a man who committed murder a millionfold. For such crimes, these men might well have been proceeded against by summary executive action and had the treatment which they had been parties to meeting out against so many millions of innocent people been meted out to them, they could hardly have complained. But this tribunal is to adjudge their guilt, not on any moral or ethical basis alone, but according to law. That natural justice, which demands that these crimes should not go unpunished, at the same time insists that no individual should be punished unless patient and careful examination of the facts shows that he shared the guilt for what has been done. And so, during these many months, this tribunal has been investigating the facts and has now to apply the law in order both that justice may be done to these individuals as to their countless victims, and also that the world may know that in the end, the predominance of power will be driven out and law and justice shall govern the relations between states. For the effects of this trial will reach out far beyond the punishment of a score or so of guilty men. Issues are at stake far greater than their fate, although upon their fate those issues in some measure depend. In the pages of history it will count for nothing whether this trial has lasted for two months or for ten. But it will count for much that by just and patient examination, 
that truth has been established about deeds so terrible that their mark may never be erased. And it will count for much that law and justice have been vindicated in the end. Within the space of a year, evidence far exceeding that previously presented to any tribunal in history has been collected, sifted, and placed before you. Almost all of that evidence consists of the captured records and documents of the government to which these men belonged, and much of it directly implicates each one of them with knowledge of and participation in one or other aspect of the crimes committed by the Nazi state. This evidence has not been refuted and it will remain forever to confront those who may hereafter seek to excuse or mitigate that which has been done. Yet now that this mass of evidence has been presented to you, I shall invite you for a little to detach your minds from its detail to consider the cumulative effect and to review this overwhelming case as a whole. It is only by chance that uh, their own captured papers have enabled us to establish these crimes out of the very mouths of the criminals. But um, the case against these men can be established on a, on a broader basis than that, and it has to be looked at in the light of its historical background. When one considers the nature and the immensity of the crimes committed, the responsibility of those who held the highest positions of influence and authority in the Nazi state is manifest beyond doubt. For years, in a world where war had itself been declared a crime, the German state was organized for war. For years, in a world where we proclaimed the equality of man, the Jews were boycotted, deprived of their elementary rights of property, liberty, life itself. For years, honest citizens lived in fear of denunciation and arrest by one or other of the organizations, criminal as we allege them to be, through which these men ruled over Germany. And for years, throughout the German Reich, millions of foreign slaves worked in farm and factory, were moved like cattle on every road, on every railway line. These men, with Himmler, with Hitler, Himmler, Goebbels, and a few other Confederates, were at once the leaders and the drivers of the German people. It was when they held the highest positions of authority and of influence that these crimes were planned and perpetrated. <coughs> if these men are not responsible, who are? If minions who did no more than obey their orders, Dostler, Eck, Kramer and a hundred others have already paid the supreme penalty, are these men less responsible? How can it be said that they and the offices of state which they directed took no part? Lammers, their own witness, head of the Reich Chancellery, said in 1938, despite the total basic concentration of power of authority in the person of the Führer, no excessively strong and unnecessary centralization of administration in the hands of the Führer results in the government administration. The subordinate leaders, the Unterführer's authority, directed downwards, forbids interference with every individual order he may issue. This principle is manipulated by the Führer in his governmental leadership in such a way that, for example, the position of Reich ministers is actually much more independent today than formerly even though today the Reich ministers are subordinated to the Führer's unlimited power of command. Willingness to bear responsibility, ability to make decisions, 
aggressive energy and real authority. These are the qualities which the Führer demands primarily of his subordinate leaders. Therefore, he allows them the greatest freedom in the execution of their affairs and in the manner in which they fulfill their tasks. Let them now, accused murderers as they are, attempt to belittle the power and influence they exercised how they will. We have only to recall their ranting as they strutted across the stage of Europe, dressed in their brief authority to see the part they played. They did not then tell the German people or the world that they were merely the ignorant, powerless puppets of their Führer. The defendant Speer has said, even in a totalitarian system, there must be total responsibility. It is impossible after the catastrophe to evade this total responsibility. If the war had been won, the leaders would also have assumed total responsibility. Had the war been won, is it to, to be supposed that these men would have retired to the obscurity and comparative innocence of private citizenship? That opportunity was not denied to them before the war, had they wished to disassociate themselves from what was taking place. They chose a different path. From small beginnings, at a time when resistance, instead of participation, could have destroyed this thing, they fostered the Hitler legend, they helped to build up the Nazi power and ideology and to direct its activities until, like some foul octopus, it spread its slime over Europe and extended its tentacles throughout the world. Were these men ignorant of the ends sought to be achieved during that period of the rise to power? Paul Schmidt, Hitler's interpreter, a witness of great knowledge, has testified the general objectives of the Nazi leadership were apparent from the start, namely the domination of the European continent to be achieved first by the incorporation of all German-speaking groups in the Reich and secondly by territorial expansion under the slogan of Lebensraum. That slogan, Lebensraum, that entirely false idea that the very existence of the German people depended upon territorial expansion under the Nazi flag. That slogan was from the earliest days an openly avowed part of the Nazi doctrine. Yet any thinking person must have known that it would lead inevitably to war. It was the justification Hitler offered to his fellow conspirators at those secret meetings on the 5th of November, 1937, 23rd of May and the 23rd of November 1939, at which the fate of so many countries was sealed. Although less concrete, it was no less false than the demand for a revision of the Treaty of Versailles, the so-called injustice of Versailles, so cunningly exploited to provide a popular rallying point under the Nazi banner had succeeded in uniting behind the Nazis many Germans who would not otherwise have supported some of the rest of the Nazi program. And the effect of that propaganda can be judged from the repeated efforts here made by the defense to develop the alleged injustice of the treaty. Unjust or not, it was a treaty and no government content to live at peace need have complained of its provisions. Even if the complaints were justified, there was comparatively soon no ground left for them. Of the treaty could have been, in some respects they were, revised by peaceful negotiation. By 1935, four years before the world, the world was plunged into war, these men had publicly renounced the treaty. What miserable rubbish is the long tirade directed against the treaty on behalf of Hess 
when one realises that by 1939, not only were they free of nearly all the restrictions of which they had complained, but they had seized territory which had never belonged to Germany in the whole of European history. The cry of Versailles was a device for rallying men to wicked and aggressive purposes. But it was a device less diabolical than the cry of anti-Semitism and racial purity by which these men sought both to rally and cement the various forms of public opinion in their own country and to sow discord and antagonism amongst the people of foreign lands. Rauschning reports Hitler's statement, and I quote, anti-Semitism is a useful revolutionary expedient. Anti-Semitic propaganda in all countries is an almost indispensable medium in the extension of our political campaign. You will see how little time we shall need in order to upset the ideas and criteria of the whole world simply and solely by attacking Judaism. It is beyond question the most important weapon in my propaganda arsenal. And as a result of uh, this wicked propaganda, I would remind you of the words of Bach Zelewski, who, when he was asked how Ohlendorf could admit that the men under his command had murdered 90,000 people, replied, and I quote, I am of the opinion that when for years, for decades, the doctrine is preached that the Slav race is an inferior race and Jews not even human, then such outcome is inevitable. And so from the earliest days, the aims of the Nazi movement were clear and beyond doubt, expansion, European domination, elimination of the Jews, ultimate aggression, ruthless disregard of the rights of any people but themselves. Such were the beginnings. I shall not pause to trace the Nazi party's growth to power. How, as the writer of the history of the SA has said, they found that, and I quote, possession of the streets is the key to power in the state. Or how, by the organized terror which the witness Severing has described, the stormtroops of black shirts terrified the people while Nazi propaganda, headed by der Sturmer, vilified all opponents and incited the people against the Jews. I shall not examine that period. Grave as are the lessons which democratic peoples ought to learn from it. For it may not be easy to say exactly at what date each of these defendants must have realized, if indeed he had not known and gloried in it from the uh, beginning, that Hitler's apparently hysterical outpourings in Mein Kampf were intended in all seriousness and that they formed the very basis of the German plan. Some, no doubt, such as Goering, Hess, Ribbentrop, Rosenberg, Stryker, Frick, Frank, Schacht, Schirach, and Fritscher realized it very early. In the case of one or two, such as Dönitz and Speer, it may have been comparatively late. Few can have been ignorant after 1933. All must have been participants by 1937. When one remembers the apprehension caused abroad during that period. There can be no doubt in our submission that these men, almost all of whom were the rulers um, of Germany from 1933 onwards, Hitler's intimate associates, admitted to his secret meetings with full knowledge of plans and events, not only acquiesced in what was taking place, but were active and willing participants in it. May I then examine in, in a little more detail the period of the build-up, the position of domestic government in Germany between 1933 and 1939. Because what happened then makes clear the criminal involvement of these men 
in what was done later. What I say now has uh, some special reference to the first count in the indictment, for it is against this general background that must be considered the allegation that these men were common conspirators to commit the crimes, such as the crimes against peace and the crimes against humanity, which are more specifically charged in the later counts. Totalitarian government brooks no opposition. Any means justifies the end, and the immediate end was ruthlessly to gain complete control of the German state and to brutalize and train its people for war. What stood in the way in January 1933? Firstly, the members of the other political parties. Secondly, the democratic system of election and of a public assembly, the organization of labor in trade unions. And thirdly, the moral standards of the German people and the churches which fostered them. And accordingly, the Nazis set out, quite deliberately, to eliminate this opposition. The first, by imprisoning or terrorizing their opponents. The second, by declaring illegal all elements of tolerance and liberalism. Outlawing trade unions and opposition parties. Reducing the democratic assembly to a farce and controlling ele elections. And the third, by systematic discouragement and persecution of religion, by replacing the ethics of Christianity with the idolatry of the Führer and the cult of the blood, and by rigidly controlling education and youth. Youth. Youth was systematically prepared for war and taught to hate and persecute the Jews. The plans for aggression required a nation trained in brutality and taught that it was both necessary and heroic to invade the peoples of other countries. It is a measure of the wickedness and effectiveness of this domestic policy that after six years of rule, the Nazis found little difficulty in leading a perverted nation into the greatest criminal enterprise of history. It is worth perhaps considering from the evidence a few examples of how this policy developed during those six years. And they're examples of what was happening in every German town and, and village. It, it must be um, remembered here that in the need to avoid um, cumulative evidence, you have in the result been deprived of its cumulative effect. First then, the elimination of the political opponents. Within six weeks of the Nazis coming to power in January 1933, the German newspapers were quoting official sources for the statement that 18,000 communists had been imprisoned, whilst um, the 10,000 prisoners in the jails of Prussia included many socialists and intellectuals. The fate of many of these men were was described by Severing, who estimated that at least 1,500 social democrats and a similar number of communists were murdered in the concentration camps recently established by Goering as chief of the Gestapo. Those camps, controlled by the party organizations, were deliberately so run as to strike terror throughout the country. In the words of Severing, the concentration camps represented for the people of Germany the incarnation of all the terrible. <coughs> Goering has said, we found it necessary that we should permit no opposition to us. And he admitted that there were arrested and taken into protective custody people who had committed no crime. Might have been well if at that time they had remembered the maxim of which they spoke yesterday. Nulla poena sine lege. Goering added, if everyone knows that if he acts against the state he will end up in a concentration camp, that is to our advantage. The camps were at first run indiscriminately by the SA and the SS, 
and according to uh, Goering, were created as an instrument which at all times was the inner political instrument of power. Gesevius, who at that time had recently joined the Gestapo, remember, gave the following description. I was hardly more than two days in that new police office when I discovered already that incredible conditions existed there. There was no police which interfered against crimes, against murder, against arrests, against burglary. There was a police organization which protected just those who committed such crimes. Those arrested were not those who were guilty of such crimes. They arrested those who sent their cries for help to the police. It was not a police which interfered for protection, but a police whose task, it seemed, was in fact to hide, to cover up, and to sponsor crimes. Those commandos of the SA and SS who played police were encouraged by that so-called secret state police, and all possible aid was given to them. Special concentration camps for the Gestapo were installed, and their names will remain for a terrible shame in history. They were Oranienburg, and the private prison of the Gestapo in the Papenstrasse, the Columbia House, or as it was called cynically, the Columbia Dealer. I asked one of my colleagues, who was also a professional civil servant, tell me please, am I here in a police office or in a robber's cave? And the answer that I received was, you're in a burglar's cave and you can expect that you will see much more yet. Gesevius went on to describe Goering's order to murder the National Socialist, Strasser, and how he gave blank authority for murder to the political police, signing a form, granting amnesty to the policeman, and leaving a blank space for the name of the murdered person, in respect of whom the amnesty had been granted. If confirmation of the evidence of these witnesses, these defence witnesses, uh, were acquired, it is to be found in the series of reports dated in May and in June of 1933 from the Munich public prosecutor to the Minister of Justice, which are in evidence before you, recording a succession of murders by SS officials in the concentration camp at Dachau. In 1935, the Reich Minister of Justice is writing to Frick. He's protesting against numerous instances of ill treatment in a concentration camp, including beating, and I quote, beating as a disciplinary punishment, ill treatment, mostly of political internees, in order to make them talk, and ill treatment of internees arising out of sheer fun or sadistic motives. He went on to complain, the beating of communists held in custody is regarded as an indispens indispensable police measure for a more effective suppression of communist activity. And then, after citing instances of torture, he concludes, these few examples show a degree of cruelty which is an insult to every German sensibility. Frick's sensibility was apparently not so tender. Very next year, he received a similar protest from one of his own subordinates, and um, shortly afterwards, he issued a decree making all police forces subordinate to Himmler the very man whom he knew to be responsible for these very atrocities. These um, brutalities, well known to ministers as we suggest they were, were not confined to the privacy of the concentration camps. It's perhaps worth quoting one instance from the thousands who suffered from the policy which was being pursued. The tribunal will remember the account given by uh, Solomon, um, a social democrat, a member of the Reichstag from 1919 to 1933. He spoke of the incident on March the 9th, 1933, when, to quote his own words, members of the SS and SA came to my home in Cologne and destroyed the furniture and my personal record. 
that time I was taken to the Brown House in Cologne, where I was tortured, being beaten and kicked for several hours. I was then taken to the regular government prison in Cologne, where I was treated by two medical doctors and released the next day. On March the 11th, 1933, I left Germany. The second object, the suppression of all democratic institutions, was um, comparatively simple. The necessary laws were passed to outlaw trade unions. The Reichstag became a farce. Directly, the opposition parties had been dissolved and their members had been put into concentration camps. The witness Severing has uh, spoken of the treatment of the uh, Reichstag members. In 1932, on uh, von Papen's order, he, who was chief of the Prussian Ministry of the Interior, was forcibly removed from his office. It was not long after the 30th of January of 1933 that the communist and social democratic parties were decreed illegal and all form of public expression other than by the Nazis was uh, prevented. That action resulted from deliberate planning. Frick had said uh, as long before as 1927 that the National Socialists longed for the day when they could put an inglorious but well-deserved end to this infernal sham of Parliament and open the way for a racial dictatorship. At this time, when democratic government is seeking to re-establish itself throughout the world, the Nazi attitude to elections is not to be forgotten. Free elections could not, of course, be permitted. Goering had told Schacht in February 1933, when seeking money for the party from industry, and I quote, the sacrifices asked for will surely be so much easier for industry to bear if it is realized that the election of March the 5th will be the last one for the next 10 years, probably for the next hundred years. And uh, in those circumstances, it's not surprising to find that thereafter, as the evidence such as the SD report on the conduct of the plebiscite at Kappel makes clear, the occasional votes of the people, always announced as triumphs for the Nazis, were conducted dishonestly. I turn now to the, the third class of opposition, the churches. Bormann's memorandum, sent in December 1941 to all the Gauleiters and distributed to the SS, sums up the Nazi attitude to Christianity. National socialist and Christian concepts, and I'm quoting, are irreconcilable. If therefore in the future, our youth knows nothing more of this Christianity, whose doctrines are far below ours, Christianity will disappear by itself. All influences which might impair or damage the leadership of the people, exercised by the Führer with the aid of the NSDAP, must be eliminated. More and more, the people must be separated from the churches and their organs, the pastors. The persecution of the churches makes a melancholy story from the abundance of evidence which has been submitted uh, to the tribunal, it is perhaps permissible to quote from a complaint made to Frick early in 1936. And I quote, Lately, half the political police reports concern clerical matters. We have untold petitions from all kinds of cardinals, bishops, and dignitaries of the church. Most of these complaints concern matters under the jurisdiction of the Reich Minister of the Interior, although the respective rules were not decreed by it. And then, um, after referring to the chaos resulting from the division of authority between the different police forces, the report went on to refer to the results of the religious struggle. Instances of gross disturbances of congregations are mounting terribly fast. Lately, terribly fast lately, often necessitating the intervention of the emergency squad. 
After discarding the rubber truncheon, the idea of exposing executive officials to situations in which, during gross interruption of meetings, they may be used to force, uh, they may be forced to use cold steel is um, unbearable. The diary of the Minister of Justice for 1935 provides ample instances of the sort of behaviour which was being encouraged by the Hitler Youth under the defendant Scharach and the defendant Rosenberg. The Hitler Jugend, whose membership increased from just under 108,000 in 1932 to nearly 8 million in 1939, was organized on a military basis. The close collaboration between um, Keitel and Scharach in their military education has been described. The special arrangement between Scharach and Himmler, uh, by which the Hitler Jugend became the recruiting organization for the SS, is in evidence. And you will not have forgotten the words of uh, Scharach's deputy. In the course of years, we want to ensure that a gun feels just as natural in the hands of a German boy as a pet. What a horrible doctrine. The terrorization, murder, and persecution of political opponents, the dissolution of all organizations affording opportunity for opposition, criticism, or even free speech, the systematic perversion of youth and training for war, would not, however, have sufficed without the persecution of the Jews. Let no one be misled by the metaphysical explanations which are put forward for this most frightful crime. What Hitler himself, in this very town, described as the fanatical combat against the Jews was part and parcel of the policy for establishing Ein Volk, Ein Herrenvolk, which should dominate Europe and the world. And so the uh, persecution of the Jews was popularized throughout the country. It provided a cement which bound the people to the regime. It gave the youths a butt to bully and so to acquire practical schooling in brutality. With the accession to power, the persecution of the Jews increased in violence. The final solution, as it has been called, the final solution of mass murder, had even then been conceived. In Mein Kampf, the Bible of these defendants, Hitler had regretted that poison gas had not been employed to exterminate German Jews during the last war. And as early as 1925, Stryker said, let us make a new beginning today so that we can annihilate the Jew. It may be that he, even before Hitler, Himmler, or the others, had visualized the annihilation of the Jews, but um, the Nazis were not, at first, ready to defy, completely to defy world opinion and they confined themselves to persecution and to making life in Germany unbearable for Jews. And to the never ceasing accompaniment of the Sturmer and the official Nazi press, the campaign of Jew baiting was fostered and encouraged. Rosenberg, von Scharach, Goering, Hess, Funk, Bormann, Frick joined hands with Stryker and Goebbels. The boycott in April 1933 celebrated the Nazi accession to power, but it provided only a taste of what was to follow. It was accompanied by um, demonstrations, by window smashing, action mirror, as it has been referred to in this court. Accounts of typical incidents are given in the affidavit of the witness Geist, who describes the event in the events in Berlin on March the 6th of 1933. Wholesale attacks, I quote, on the communists, Jews, and those who were suspected of being either. Mobs of SA men roamed the street, beating up, looting, and even killing per persons. 
And then in 1935 followed the infamous Nuremberg Decrees. In 1938, the so-called spontaneous um, demonstration ordered throughout Germany resulted in the burning of the synagogues, the throwing of 20,000 Jews into concentration camps uh, with the accompaniment of penalties of Aryanization of property and the wearing of the yellow star. The cynicism of these men, the merciless character of their policy towards the Jews, appeared at Goering's meeting on the 12th of November 1938, when they vied with each other in suggesting methods of degrading and persecuting their helpless victims. Neither Hitler nor Himmler, whom today they seek to blame, was present. But who, reading the record of that meeting, can doubt the end which was in store for the Jews of Europe? That meeting, Heydrich reported <coughs> on the events which had occurred on the night of the 9th, 10th November, 101 synagogues destroyed by fire, 76 demolished and 7,500 stores ruined throughout the Reich. The approximate cost of replacing broken glass alone estimated at 6 million Reichsmarks. The damage to one store alone in Berlin at 1,700,000 Reichsmarks. Heydrich um, reported 800 cases of looting, killing of 35 Jews, and estimated the total damage of property, furniture, and goods at several hundred million Reichmarks, including the arrests of the Jews and their removal to concentration camps. After referring to the fact that demonstrations were to be expected in view of the killing of a German legation official in Paris that night, he instructed the police uh, about the prospective burning of the synagogues, the destruction of business and private apartments of the Jews, and in their duty to refrain from hindering the demonstrators. The police has only to supervise compliance with the instruction, I quote, and again it went on. In all districts, as many Jews, especially rich ones, are to be arrested as can be accommodated in the existing prisons. For the time being, only healthy men, not too old, are to be arrested. On their arrest, the appropriate concentration camps should be contacted immediately in order to confine them in those camps as fast as possible. We now know from the evidence uh, with regard to the seizure of the houses of Jews by Norath and Rosenberg why the orders were to concentrate upon the richest. These events were neither secret nor hidden. Ministers were writing to each other and, and discussing them. Long before 1939, they were common knowledge, not only to Germany, but to the whole world. Every one of these defendants must have heard again and again stories similar to that of Salma. Almost all of them have sought to gain credit from helping one or two Jews. And you'll remember the evidence of a special office in Goering's uh, ministry to deal with protests and his witness Kerner who uh, stated with pride that Goering had always intervened on behalf of individuals. Perhaps it afforded them some gratification or eased their consciences in some way occasionally to demonstrate their influence by exempting some unhappy individual who uh, sought their favor from the general horror of the regime which they continue to uphold. But these men participated in a government which was conducted without any regard for human decency or established law. There is not one of them who, being a member of the government during that period, has not got the blood of hundreds of his countrymen upon his hands. Goering and Frick established the concentration camps. The witness Severing and the documents quoted 
testify to the murders which took place in them at a time when these two were directly responsible. Even Goering could not defend all the murders of the 30th of June of 1934. He shares with Hess and Frick the responsibility for the Nuremberg laws. In the record of the meeting of the 12th November 1938, Goering's initials on Heydrich's order of the 9th of November require no comment. As ambassador in England, Ribbentrop must have been well aware of the facts, if only from the English newspapers, whilst his delegate, Vermin, assented to the atrocities reported to the meeting of the 12th of November of 1938. Previous owner of his country house, Herr von Remitz, was placed in a concentration camp, and Ribbentrop expressed his sentiments towards the Jews to Monsieur Bonnet on the 8th of December 1938 in the following terms. The German government, and I quote, had therefore decided to assimilate them, that is the Jews, to assimilate them with the criminal elements of the population. The property which they had acquired illegally would be taken from them. They would be forced to live in districts frequented by the criminal classes. Hess, who set up an office for racial policy in 1933, shares the responsibility for the Nuremberg Decrees. At the meeting of the 12th of November of 1938, a full report was given of similar measures against the Jews in Austria, and it seems certain that the defendant, Kaltenbrunner, as a faithful member of the party, was giving full support to the necessary measures. The evidence that um, Seisinkart was playing his part is before the tribunal. Rosenberg was writing the myth of the 20th century and taking his full share in the struggle against the church and in the anti-Semitic policy of the government, while even Rader, on Heroes Day in 1939, was speaking, and I quote, of the clear and inspiring summons to fight Bolshevism and international jury whose race-destroying activities we have sufficiently experienced on our own people. Frick, as Minister of the Interior, bears a responsibility which is second to none for the horrors of the concentration camps and for the Gestapo, and Frank, as Minister of Justice for Bavaria, was presumably receiving the reports on the murders at Dachau. He was the leading jurist of the party, member of the Central Committee which carried out the boycott of the Jews in March 1933, and he spoke on the wireless in March 1934, justifying racial legislation and the elimination of hostile political organizations. And he was also present at that meeting of Goering's. Of Stryker, the tribunal will hardly be required to be reminded of the part that he played. It was in March 1938 that the Sturmer began consistently to advocate extermination. The first article of a series which was to continue during the next seven years, signed by Stryker, ending with the words, and I quote, we are approaching wonderful times, a greater Germany without Jews. Funk, as vice president of the Reich Chamber for Culture, from 1933, had um, participated in the policy for the elimination of the Jews. He was present and assented to the recommendations at Goering's November meeting in 1938, at which you'll recall, um, Goering suggested that it would have been better to kill 200 Jews, whereupon Heydrich mentioned that, um, in fact, the number was a mere 35. Schacht himself, admitted that as early as the second half of 1934 and the first half of 1935, he found he was wrong in thinking that Hitler would bring the revolutionary forces of the Nazis into a regulated atmosphere. And that um, he discovered that um, Hitler having done nothing to stop the excesses of individual party members or party groups was in fact pursuing a policy of terror. Nevertheless, he remained in office 
and Shaft accepted the Golden Party badge in January 1937 when Von Elts refused it. Scharach has confirmed his part in ensuring that the younger generation of Germany grew up rabid anti-Semites under his teaching. He cannot escape responsibility for training the youth to bully Jews, to persecute the church, to prepare for war. This perversion of children is perhaps the basest crime of them all. Sauckel, who joined the party in 1921, filled the post of Gauleiter of um, Thuringia. He cannot have been ignorant of the persecution of the churches, of the trade unions, of the other political parties, and of the Jews, taking place throughout his important Gau. And uh, there is every reason to suppose that he gave the fullest support to those policies and thus enhanced his reputation with the Nazis. Papen and von Neurath were in a better position to judge these matters than any of the other defendants, since it was their political associates who were being uh, persecuted, whilst in the case of Papen, some of his own staff were killed and he himself arrested, lucky to escape with his life. Neurath's attitude to the Jews is shown by his uh, speech in September 1933. And I quote, the stupid talk about purely internal affairs, as for example the Jewish question, will quickly be silenced if one realizes that the necessary cleaning up of public life must temporarily entail individual cases of personal hardship, but that nevertheless it only served to establish all the more firmly the authority of justice and law in Germany. What prostitution of these great words. Of the remainder, all were men of intelligence, already held positions of considerable authority. None of them can have been ignorant of that which the whole world knew. Yet not one of them has suggested that he made any effective protest against this regime of brutality and terror. All of these men continued in their spheres of government and in the highest positions of responsibility. Each in his part, and each a vital part, these men built up the evil thing, the ultimate purpose of which was so well known to them, and instilled the evil doctrines which were essential to the achievement of that purpose. It was Lord Acton, that great European, who 80 years ago, in expressing his conviction of the sanctity of human life, said, and I quote, the greatest crime is homicide. The accomplice is no better than the assassin. The theorist is the worst. I shall return, if I may, later to the question of conspiracy and to the part these men played in it. But no conclusion upon the conspiracy charge in the first count of this indictment is really possible until the specific crimes set out in the subsequent counts have been considered. And first of these is the crime against peace, set out in count two. I say first, first in its, um, in its place in the indictment moralists may argue, uh, which is the greatest in moral guilt. But this perhaps should be said at the very outset. It's said that there is no such crime as a crime against peace. And those superficial thinkers who, whether in this court or in armchairs elsewhere, have questioned the validity of these proceedings, have made them um, much of this argument, of its merits, I shall have something to say presently. But let it be said plainly now that these defendants are charged also as common murderers. That charge alone merits the imposition of the supreme penalty. And the joinder of, in the indictment of this crime against peace can add nothing to the penalty which may be imposed on these individuals.
Is it then a mere work of um, supererogation to have included this matter in the indictment at all? We think not. We think not for the very reason that more is at stake in this trial than the fate of these individuals. It is the crime of war which is at once the object and the parent of the other crimes, the crimes against humanity, the war crimes, the common murders. These things occur when men embark on total war as an instrument of policy for aggressive ends. Moreover, taking this crime, the crime against peace in isolation, it was responsible for the deaths in battle of um, 10 million people for bringing to the very edge of ruin the whole moral and material structure of our civilization. And although it may be that it may add nothing to the penalty which may be imposed upon these men, it is a fundamental part of these proceedings to establish for all time that international law has the power, inherent in its very nature, both to declare that a war is criminal and to deal with those who aid and abet their states in its commission. I, I shall come back to the law. Let me refer, firstly, quite shortly, to the facts. You have had from Defence Council an elaborate but um, a partial and a highly controversial account of foreign relations leading up to 1939. I do not propose to follow them in that examination, nor am I concerned to say that, uh, as events have turned out, the policies pursued by the democratic powers may not sometimes have been weak, vacillating, open to criticism. Defence Council have sought to base some argument on the protocol attached to the German-Soviet pact. They argue that um, it was wrong. I am not concerned with that matter, and of course I do not concede it, but let them argue that it was wrong. Do two wrongs make a right? Not in that international law which this tribunal will administer. The review which Defence Council have made entirely overlooks the two basic facts in this case. That from the time of Mein Kampf on, the whole aim of Nazi policy was expansion, aggression, domination. And that the democratic powers had to deal with a Germany of which that was, in spite of occasional lip service to peace, the fundamental aim. If peace was contemplated at all, it was peace only at Germany's price. And knowing that that price would not be and could not be paid voluntarily, the Germans were determined to secure it by force. Whilst the German people were being psychologically prepared for war, the necessary measures of rearmament were being taken simultaneously. At his conference on the 23rd of November, 1939, Hitler summed up this period of preparation in these words, and I quote them. I had to reorganize everything, beginning with the mass of the people, extending it to the armed forces. First, internal reorganization, eradication of appearances of decay and of defeatist ideas, education to heroism. While reorganizing internally, I undertook the second task, to release Germany from its international ties, secession from the League of Nations, denunciation of the Arm Disarmament Conference. After that, the order for rearmament. In 1935, the introduction of compulsory armed service. After that, militarization of the Rhineland. The conspirators set out first to get rid of the political restraints which prevented rearmament. In October 1933, Germany left the League of Nations and in March 1935, renounced the armament clauses of Versailles and informed the world of the establishment 
of an Air Force with a large standing army of conscription. Already the Reich Defence Council had been set up and its working committee had had its second meeting as early as the 26th of April 1933 with representatives of every department. It is difficult, is it not, to believe that reading the minutes of these meetings as they must have done, Neurath, Frick, Schacht, Goering, Rader, Keitel, Jodl, and the last two generally being there themselves, can have supposed that this regime did not intend war. On the economic side, Schacht, already president of the Reichsbank and minister of economics, was made general plenipotentiary for war economy in May 1935. The appointment was to be a complete secret and his contribution is best expressed in his own words. And I quote them. It is possible that no bank of issue in peacetime carried on such a daring credit policy as the Reichsbank since the seizure of power by National Socialism. With the aid of this credit policy, however, Germany created an armament second to none, and this armament, in turn, made possible the results of our policy. Schacht's speech on the 29th of November, 1938, is seen to be no boast when the report of his deputy, which has been uh, put in evidence, is considered. That report shows that uh, under Schacht's guidance, 180,000 industrial plants had been surveyed as to usefulness for war purposes. Economic plans for the production of 200 basic materials had been worked out. A system for the letting of war contracts had been revised. Allocations of coal, motor fuel, and power had been determined. 248 million Reichsmarks had been spent on storage facilities alone. Evacuation plans for skilled workers and war materials from military zones had been worked out. 80 million wartime ration cards had already been printed and distributed to local areas. And a card index on the skill of some 20 million workers had been prepared. The most detailed and thorough preparation which that report sets out were not made without the knowledge of every member of the government. And um, no more graphic illustration of the common purpose and awareness of the aim which permeated all departments of the state can be found than um, the second meeting of the Reich's Defense Council itself held on the 25th of June, 1939, under the presidency of the defendant Goering, the head of the four-year plan. The defendants, Frick, Funk, Keitel, and Reda were present. Hess and Ribbentrop were represented. The methodical detail in the plans which were being worked out, the preparations in respect of manpower, involving the use of concentration camp workers and the unfortunate slaves of the protectorate, are eloquent testimonies to the size of the struggle upon which these men knew that Germany was about to embark. The major share in rearmament must be attributed to the defendants Goering, Schacht, Reda, Keitel, and Jodl, but the others too, each in his sphere, played their parts. Rosenberg, Schirach, and Stryker in education, Dönitz in the preparation of the U-boat fleet, Neurath and Ribbentrop in the field of foreign affairs. Funk and Fritscher were reorganizing propaganda and news systems until Funk succeeded Schacht and became Minister of Economics and in September 1938, General Plenipotentiary for Economics. As Plenipotentiary, Funk was uh, concerned with ensuring the economic conditions for the production of the armament industry according to the requirements of the High Command. Frick, as Plenipotentiary for the Reich Administration with Funk and Keitel, formed the three-man college, planning the necessary steps and decrees in case of war. It is unnecessary in assessing this work of rearmament to do more by way of summary than to quote the words of Hitler himself in the memorandum which Jodl described as written during two nights of work by the Führer personally 
and which he sent to the defendants Rader, Goering and Keitel. In that memorandum of the 9th of October 1939, Hitler finally disposes of the evidence of these defendants that Germany was never adequately prepared for war. I quote, the military application of our people's strength has been carried through to such an extent that within a short time, at any rate, it cannot be markedly improved upon by any manner of effort. And again, the warlike equipment of the German people is at present larger in quantity and better in quality for a great number of German divisions than in the year 1914. The weapons themselves, taking a substantial cross-section, are more modern than is the case with any other country in the world at this time. They have just proved their supreme war worthiness in a victorious campaign. In the case of the armaments of other countries, this has yet to be demonstrated. In some arms, Germany today possesses clear, indisputable superiority of weapons. And then, speaking of the ammunition available uh, after the conclusion of the Polish campaign, and I quote, there is no evidence available to show that any country in the world disposes of a better total of ammunition stock than the German Reich. The Air Force, at present, is numerically the strongest in the world. The AA artillery is not equaled by any country in the world. That, then, was the practical result of six years of intensive rearmament carried out at the expense and with the knowledge of the whole of the German people. Meanwhile, the youth of Germany was educated and drilled in uh, semi-military formations for war. And then on reaching, reaching the age for conscription was called up for more intensive training. That was going on throughout the Reich, uh, together with the enormous work of economic preparation. Is it to be believed that any one of these men did not guess, did not indeed know the purpose of this terrific effort. If indeed any of them was in doubt, the successful actions in which, to use the words of one of Nora's uh, witnesses, the Nazis were able to reap cheap laurels without war through the successfully practiced tactics of bluff and sudden surprise, must have opened their eyes. The first step was the Rhineland and the technique became the model for every subsequent move. On the 21st of May, 1935, Hitler gave a solemn assurance that the stipulations of Versailles and Locarno were being observed. <coughs> Yet, three weeks earlier, on the very day of the conclusion of the Franco-Soviet pact, later to become the official excuse for the reoccupation of the Rhineland and the defense for it before this tribunal, the first directive for reoccupation had, or had been issued to the service chiefs. The defendant Yodel, having uh, noted perhaps the significance of the date, has sought to persuade the tribunal that um, his first admission that Operation Schulung referred to the reoccupation of the Rhineland was wrong and that it applied to some military excursion in the Tyrol. Yet on the 26th of June, he himself was addressing the working committee of the Reich Defense Council on the plans for reoccupation and revealing that weapons, equipment, insignia and field gray uniforms were being stored in the zone under conditions of the greatest secrecy. Can anyone who reads his words doubt that that process had been going on at least for seven weeks? Any representative of the innumerable departments who attended that meeting, who heard Yodel's remarks at meeting on the 26th of June, or who subsequently read the minutes, knew what to expect. On the 2nd of March, the final orders were given and passed to the Navy four days later. The defendants, Keitel, Yodel, Rader, Frick, Schacht, and Goering, were all involved in the necessary executive action. If his U-boats complied with the instructions of the 6th of March, the defendant Dönitz as well. From the beginning, at every stage, you see the common plan worked out, and worked out as it only could have been worked out if each of these men each played his allotted part. 
first the period of apparent quiet, during which treaties are concluded, assurances given, protestations of friendship made, while beneath the surface the Auslands organization under Hess and Rosenberg begins to undermine and to disrupt. The victim is deceived by open promises and weakened by underhand methods. Next, the decision to attack is taken and military preparations are hastened. If the victim shows signs of suspicion, the assurances of friendship are redoubled. Meanwhile, the finishing touches are put to the work accomplished by the fifth column. And then, when all is prepared, what Hitler called the propagandist cause for starting the war is chosen. Frontier incidents perhaps are fate. Abuse and threats take the place of fair words. Everything is done to terrify the victim into submission. Finally, the blow is struck without warning. The plan varies in detail from case to case, but essentially, it is the same, the perfect example, repeated again and again, of treachery, intimidation, murder. The next step was Austria. First, the Nazis arranged the murder of Dolfus in 1934. After the evidence in the case of the defendant Norath, there can be little doubt that um, the assassination of Dolfus was plotted in Berlin and arranged by Habeck and Hitler some six weeks before. The failure of that putsch made it necessary to temporize, and accordingly, in May of 1935, Hitler gave a complete assurance to Austria. And at the same time, the defendant uh, Papen was sent to undermine the Austrian government. Uh, with the occupation of the Rhineland, Austria uh, was next on the program, but Hitler was not yet ready and uh, hence the solemn agreement of July 1936. By the autumn of 1937, Papen's reports showed progress, and accordingly the plot was divulged at the Hosbach meeting. A slight delay was necessary for the removal of the refractory army leaders, but um, in February 1938, Papen, having committed his uh, plotting with uh, Seisinkwart, Schusnig was lured to Berchtesgaden and bullied by Hitler, Ribbentrop and Keitel. Shortly afterwards, the final scene took place, Goering playing his part in Berlin. The defendants Goering, Hess, Keitel, Jodl, Reda, Frick, Schacht, Papen and Neurath were all aware of this Austrian plot, and Neurath and Papen from the very beginning of it. With the exception of Goering, each one of them has attempted to put forward a defense of ignorance, which cannot be regarded as other than ludicrous in the light of the documents. Not one of them has suggested that he protested. Each one of them remained in office thereafter. Already the plan for Czechoslovakia was ready. It had been discussed at the Hosbach meeting in November 1937, Within three weeks of the Munich Agreement, the directive to prepare the march in had been given. On the 15th of March, 1939, President Hascha, having been duly bullied by Hitler, Ribbentrop, Goering and Keitel, Prague was occupied in the protectorate established by Frick and Neurath. You'll, you'll remember the astonishing admission by Goering that although he certainly threatened to bomb Prague, he never really intended to do it. And Ribbentrop also seems to have considered that in diplomacy any lie is permissible. And the stage was now set for Poland. As Yodel explained, I quote, the solution of the Czech conflict and the annexation of Czechoslovakia rounded off the territory of Greater Germany so that it was possible to consider the Polish problem on a basis of more or less favorable strategic premises. And uh, now the time had come to use Hitler's words, and I quote, when Germany must reckon with its two hateful enemies, England and France. And uh, accordingly followed the policy laid down by Ribbentrop in January 1938. 
I quote, the formation in great secrecy, but with wholehearted tenacity, of a coalition against England. In the case of Poland, however, the German Foreign Office had um, already advised Ribbentrop as long ago as a month before Munich in the following terms. It is unavoidable that the German departure from the problems of victories in the southeast and their transfer to the east and the northeast must make the Poles sit up. And the fact is that after the liquidation of the Czech question, it will be generally assumed that Poland will be the next in turn. But the later this assumption sinks in in international politics as a firm factor, the better. In this sense, however, it is important for the time being to carry on German policy under the well-known and proved slogans of the right to autonomy and racial unity. Anything else might be interpreted as pure imperialism on our part and create resistance to our plan by the Entente at an earlier date and more energetically than our forces could stand up to. And so in that case, the usual assurances were reiterated and again and again, Hitler and Ribbentrop made the most explicit statements. And meanwhile, the usual steps were taken and following the meeting of the 23rd of May, 1939, which um, Rader described as an academic lecture on war, the final military, economic, and political preparations for the war against Poland were taken, and in due time, war was commenced. And you get that quotation that you've heard so often, and, and that ought to be remembered for all time. The victor shall not be asked later on whether we were telling the truth or not in starting and making a war, not the right is what matters, but uh, victory. Those were Hitler's words, but those men echoed and implemented them at every stage. That was the doctrine underlying uh, Nazi policy. Step by step, the conspirators had reached the crucial stage and had launched Germany upon an attempt to dominate the world and to involve the world in untold horror. Not one of these men had turned against the regime. Not one of them except Schacht to whose vital contribution to the creation of the Nazi monster had, I shall return later, had resigned, even he continued to lend his name to the Nazi government. Would that be a... Yes. <coughs> we'll adjourn now. Poland, having been overrun, the course of the war soon showed that Germany's military aims and the interests of her strategy would be improved by further aggression. I don't propose to take time now by tracing again the various steps. As Hitler said at the meeting in November 1939, breach of the neutrality of Belgium and Holland is meaningless. No one will question that when we have won no one will question that when we have won. We shall not bring about a breach of neutrality as in 1914. Norway and Denmark was, were invaded. No kind of excuse then or now uh, has been put forward for the occupation of Denmark. But a strenuous attempt has been made in the course of this trial to suggest that Norway was invaded only because the Germans believed that the Allies were about to take a similar step. Even if it were true, it would be no answer, but the German documents completely dispose of the suggestion that it was for such a reason that the Germans violated Norwegian neutrality. Hitler, Goering and Rader had agreed as early as November 1934 that, and I quote, no war could be carried on if the Navy was not able to safeguard the ore imports from Scandinavia. And accordingly, as the European struggle drew near, a non-aggression pact was made with Denmark on the 31st of May, 1939, following the usual assurances to both Norway and Denmark, which had um, already been given a month earlier. At the outbreak of the war, a further assurance was made to Norway followed by another on the 6th of October. On the 6th of September, 
Four days after his assurance, Hitler was discussing with Rader the Scandinavian problem and his political intentions in regard to the Nordic states, expressed in Admiral Assen's diary as, I quote, a North Germanic community with limited sovereignty in close dependence on Germany. On October the 9th, three days after his most recent assurance in his, in his memorandum for the information of Reda, Goering and uh, Keitel, Hitler was writing of the great danger of the Allies blocking the exit for U-boats between Norway and the Shetlands, and of the consequent importance, um, I quote, the creation of U-boat strong points outside these constricted home bases. Where outside the constricted home bases, if not in Norway? It is um, significant that the very next day, Dönitz submitted a report on the comparative advantage of the different Norwegian bases, having di discussed the matter with Radar some six days before. The strategic advantages were apparent to all these men, and the hollowness of the defence, that the invasion of Norway was decided upon, because it was believed that the Allies were going to invade, is completely exposed when you consider the statement in Hitler's, Hitler's memorandum preceding the passage that I just quoted. And I quote again. Provided no completely unforeseen factors appear, their neutrality in the future is also to be assured. The continuation of German trade with these countries appears possible even in a war of long duration. Hitler saw no threat from the Allies at that time. Uh, Rosenberg and Goering's deputy, Kerner, had been in touch with Quisling and uh, Hegelin as early as June, and it's clear from Rosenberg's subsequent report that Hitler had been kept fully informed. In December, the time for planning had arrived, and the decision to prepare for invasion was accordingly taken at a meeting between Hitler and Rader. It was not long before Keitel and Jodl issued the necessary directives, and in due course, and as necessary, Goering, Dönitz, and Ribbentrop became involved. On the 9th of October, as I've already said, Hitler was confident that there would be no danger to the Nordic states from the Allies. All the alleged intelligence reports contain no information which comes within miles of justifying an anticipatory invasion. You may think it laughable on the doctrine of self-preservation. It's true that in February of 1940, Rader pointed out to Hitler that if England did occupy Norway, the whole Swedish supply of ore to Germany would be endangered. But on the 26th of March, he advised that the Russo-Finnish conflict having ceased, the danger of an Allied landing was no longer considered serious. Nonetheless, he went on to uh, suggest that the German invasion, for which all the directives had been issued, should take place at the next moon on the 7th of April. It's interesting to note that um, Rader's own war diary, signed by himself and his chief of staff operations, records a similar opinion four days earlier. If um, further evidence were needed uh, to show that the actual step was taken, regardless of any risk of interference from the West, uh, it's to be found in the telegrams from the German ministers at both Oslo and Stockholm, and from the German military attaché at uh, Stockholm, advising the German government that um, far from being worried over invasion by the British, the Scandinavian governments were apprehensive that it was the Germans who intended to invade. Perhaps Jodl's comment in his diary for March that uh, Hitler, I quote, is still looking for an excuse with Rader's lame explanation that this refers to the text of the diplomatic note, which would have to be sent, and Ribbentrop's assertion that he was informed of the invasion only a day or so before it was to take place, are as conclusive as anything else of the dishonesty of this defence. Once again, all these men, in their different spheres, were playing their appointed part.
notably, of course, Rosenberg, who paved the way, Goering, Rada, Keitel, Jodl and Ribbentrop, who took the necessary executive action. Not one of them protested. Even Fritscher's only defence is that he wasn't told until a very late stage, when he was, um, as usual, required to broadcast. He doesn't suggest that he protested. Once again, a completely ruthless invasion of two countries was undertaken in breach of every treaty and assurance solely because it was strategically desirable to have Norwegian bases and to secure Scandinavian ore. And so it went on. Yugoslavia, her fate settled before the war, Greece, and then Soviet Russia. The German-Soviet pact of the 23rd of August, 1939, paved the way. Complete worthlessness of a, of a Ribbentrop um, signature is made clear by Hitler's memorandum six weeks later when he remarked, the trifling, and I quote, the trifling significance of treaties of agreement has been proved on all sides in recent years. By the 18th of December, 1940, it um, must have become apparent that the German hope of overcoming the resistance of Great Britain, then and for many months holding the fort of freedom and democracy alone against an enemy never more powerful than at that time, were they. And so the first directive was issued for an attack in another direction, this time against Soviet Russia. Uh, it is in, indeed true and it's interesting that on this occasion, a number of the defendants did make some objection. Little Norway might be violated without protest. There was no danger there. There was happy acquiescence in the rape of the gallant Netherlands, of Belgium. But here was an enemy which might perhaps strike fear in the heart of the bully. The defendants objected, of course, if at all, on purely military grounds although Rader does say that he was influenced by the moral wrong which breach of the German-Soviet treaty would involve. It's, um, it's for you to say, these moral scruples which ought so properly to have manifested themselves on uh, countless other occasions are only previously recorded when one of his officers wished to marry a lady of doubtful reputation. The truth is that some of these men were beginning to become apprehensive. Great Britain's resistance had already begun to make them think. Was Hitler now taking on another enemy whom he could not defeat? Once the decision was taken, however, every one of them set to work to play his part as before with his usual disregard for all laws of morality or even decency. In no single case did a declaration of war precede military action. How many thousands of innocent, inoffensive men, women and children sleeping in their beds in the happy belief that their country was and would remain at peace was suddenly blown into eternity by death dropped on them without warning from the sky. In what respect does the guilt of any one of these men differ from the common murderer creeping stealthily to do his victim to death in order that he may rob them of their belongings? In every single case, as the documents make clear, this was the common plan. The attack must be blitzartig schnell, without warning, with the speed of lightning. Austria, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Rader repeating Keitel's directive for heavy blows struck by surprise. Denmark, Norway, Belgium, Holland, Russia. As Hitler had said in the presence of a number of these men, considerations of right or wrong or treaties do not enter into the matter. The killing of combatants in war is justifiable both in international and in municipal law, only where the war itself is, is legal. But where a war is illegal, as a war started 
not only in breach of the Pact of Paris and other treaties, but without any sort of warning or declaration clearly is, there is nothing to justify the killing, and these murders are not to be distinguished from those of any other lawless robber bands. Every one of these men knew of these plans at one stage or another in their development. Every one of these men acquiesced in this technique, knowing full well what it must represent in terms of human life. How can any of them now say that he was not a party to common murder in its most ruthless form? But I'm dealing now not with the murders which alone so well justify the condemnation of these men, but with their crime against the peace. Let me say something about the legal aspect of this matter, for it is one to the firm establishment of which His Majesty's Government in the United Kingdom, and indeed all the Chief Prosecutors here, attach the greatest importance. The speech, distinguished speech by Professor Yarais for the defence, was free of ambiguity. The effect of it was that though the kellogg briand Pact and the other international declarations and treaties rendered aggressive war illegal, they did not make it criminal. In support of this contention, it was um, argued that they could not have done so because any attempt, any such attempt, to make aggressive war a crime would be contrary to the sovereignty of the state, and that in any event, the entire system of prohibition of war had collapsed before the outbreak of the Second World War, and um, therefore ceased to be law. It was further argued that these treaties were not taken seriously by numerous jurists and journalists whose opinions were cited, and uh, were not really entitled to be treated seriously because they contained no provision for coping with the problem of the peaceful change of the status quo. With regard to the Pact of Paris itself, the Council contended that there could be no question of a criminal or even of an unlawful breach of that treaty because it left to each state, including Germany, the right to determine whether it was entitled to go to war in self-defence. And finally, it was suggested that the state could not become the subject of criminal responsibility and that um, if that proposition were not admitted, the crime was uh, one of the German state and not of individual members of it, because in the German state which launched that war upon the world, there were no individual wills, but um, only one sovereign, uncontrolled and final will, that of the Führer, the dictator. Mr. President, it might be enough for me to say that this entire line of argument is beside the point and cannot be heard in this court since it is in contradiction to the Charter. The Charter lays down expressly that the planning, and I emphasize the word planning, preparation, initiation, or waging of a war of aggression or of a war in violation of international treaties, agreements, or assurances shall be considered crimes coming within the jurisdiction of the tribunal. And it would seem, therefore, that the only way in which the accused can escape liability is to show to the satisfaction of the tribunal that these wars were not wars of um, aggression or in violation of treaties. They have um, not done that, and that being so, one asks, what is the purpose of the argument which has been advanced on their behalf? Is it to deny the jurisdiction of the tribunal in this matter? Or, what is perhaps more probable, is it a political appeal to some outside audience which may be more easily impressed by the complaint that the accused are being made the object of the post factum legislation. Whatever its object, it is important that the argument should not go unchallenged. <clears throat> I am anxious not to take up time by repeating what I said in my opening statement on the chain affected in the position of international, in international law as the result of the long series of treaties 
in particular the general treaty for the renunciation of war. I sub submitted that that treaty, one of the most generally signed international treaties, established a rule of international law with a solemnity and clarity which is often lacking in customary international law. That the profound change which it produced, although of course, and this is um, important, although of course the distinction between the just war and the unjust war had been recognized as early as medieval times, the profound change which it uh, produced was reflected in weighty pronouncements of governments and of statesmen. I submitted that it rendered illegal recourse to war in violation of the treaty and that there is no difference between illegality and criminality in a breach of the law involving the deaths of millions and a direct attack upon the very foundations of civilized life. Nor do I propose to take time by answering in detail the if I may say so, strange chain of legal argument put forward by the defence, such as that the treaty had no effect attributed to it by its signatories, on the ground that it was received in some quarters with um, disbelief or cynicism. Even um, more um, curious to, to ordinary legal thinking is the reasoning that in any case that treaty the other treaties and assurances which uh, followed it had ceased to be legally binding by 1939 because by that time the whole in system of collective security had, uh, had collapsed. The fact that the United States declared its neutrality in 1939 was cited as an example of the collapse of the system as if the United States had been under any legal obligation to act otherwise. But what is the relevance of the fact that the system designed to enforce these treaties and to prevent and penalize criminal recourse to war failed to work. Did the aggressions of Japan and Italy, the other states involved in the Axis conspiracy, followed by the German aggressions against Austria and Czechoslovakia, deprive those obligations of their binding effect simply because those crimes achieved a temporary success? Since when has the civilized world accepted the principle that the temporary impunity of the criminal not only deprives the law of its binding force, but legalizes his crime? And you will notice, incidentally, that in the case both of the Japanese and of the Italian aggressions, the Council and the Assembly of the League of Nations denounced these acts as violations both of the Covenant and of the general treaty for the renunciation of war, and that in both cases sanctions were decreed. It may be that the policemen did not act as effectively as one could have wished them to act, but that was a failure of the policemen, not of the law. But um, not content with the remarkable suggestion that by their very aggressions, because of the reluctance of the peace-loving states to take arms against the blackmail and the bullying which was directed against them, the aggressors has, had uh, abrogated the law against aggression, the defendants have introduced some question of self-defense. They have not, um, indeed, really suggested that these wars were defensive wars, and not even Goebbels in his uh, wildest extravagances went quite so far as that. It appears that um, what they seek to say is not that their wars were wars in self-defense, but that since the Pact of Paris not only left intact the right of states to defend themselves, but also the sovereign right of each state uh, to determine whether recourse to war in self-defense was justified in the circumstances, it did not in fact contain any legal obligation at all. That is, in our strong submission, a wholly fallacious argument. It is true that in the declarations preceding and accompanying the signature and the ratification of the Pact of Paris, self-defense was not only recognized as an inherent and inalienable right of the parties to the treaty, but its signatories reserved to themselves the exclusive right of judging whether circumstances called for the exercise of that right. 
The question is whether the reservation of the right of self-defense destroyed the purpose and the legal value of the treaty. If Germany was entitled to have recourse to war in self-defense, and if she was free to determine in what circumstances she was permitted to exercise the right of self-defense, can she ever be considered to have violated the solemn obligations of the treaty? That question, counsel for the defense, sought to um, answer in the negative. But that answer amounts to an assertion that that solemn treaty, subscribed to by more than 60 nations, is a scrap of paper devoid of any meaning at all. And it would result in this, that uh, every prohibition or limitation of the right of war would be a nullity if it expressly provided for the right of self-defense. I invite the tribunal emphatically to consign that parody of legal reasoning to where it properly belongs. Neither the Pact of Paris nor any other treaty was intended, nor could it, take away the right of self-defense. Nor did it deprive its signatories of the right to determine in the first instance whether there was danger in delay and whether immediate action to defend themselves was imperative. That is the meaning, and that only is the meaning, of the express proviso that each state judges whether action in self-defense is necessary. But that does not mean that the state, which uh, thus acts, is the ultimate judge of the propriety and of the legality of its conduct. It acts at its peril. Just as the individual is answerable for the exercise of his common law right of uh, defense, so the state is answerable if it abuses its discretion if it transforms self-defense into an instrument of conquest and lawlessness, if it twists the natural right of self-defense into a weapon of predatory aggrandizement and, and lust. The ultimate decision as to the lawfulness of action claimed to be taken in self-defense does not lie with the state concerned. And for that reason, the right of self-defense, whether expressly reserved or whether implied, does not impair the capacity of a treaty to create legal obligations against war. Under the covenant of the League of Nations, Japan was entitled to decide, in the first instance, whether events in Manchuria justified resort to force in self-defense. But it was left to an impartial body of inquiry to find, as it did find, that there was in fact no justification for action in self-defense. And to mention a more recent example, Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations lays down that nothing in the Charter shall impair the inherent right of individual or collective self-defense in case of armed attack. But it expressly leaves to the Security Council the power of ultimate action and determination. It is to be hoped that the judgment of this tribunal will discourage, and discourage with appropriate finality, any future reliance on the argument that because a treaty preserves for the signatories the right of action in self-defense, it becomes, for that reason, incapable of imposing upon the signatories any effective legal obligation against war. I now turn to the argument that the notion of criminal responsibility is incompatible with the idea of national sovereignty. A state may, and Professor Yarais conceded, commit an offence against international law, but um, he contends that to make it criminally responsible and punishable would be to deny the sovereignty of the state. It is perhaps strange to see the accused, who in their capacity as the German government overran most of the states of Europe, who trampled brutally upon their sovereign independence and who with boastful and swaggering cynicism made the sovereignty of conquered states subservient to the new conception of the Grossrams Ordung. It's uh, strange to see these defendants appealing to the mystic virtues of the sanctity of state sovereignty. And perhaps it's not less remarkable to find them invoking orthodox international law to 
protect the defeated German states, a state and its rulers from just punishment at the hands of the victorious powers. But there is no rule of international law which they can call in aid in, in this regard. In a sense, these proceedings are not concerned with punishing the German state. They are concerned with the punishment of individuals. But um, it might seem strange if individuals were criminally responsible for the acts of the state, if such acts by the state were not themselves crimes. There is, in our submission, no substance at all in the view that international law rules out the criminal responsibility of states and that because of their sovereignty states and that since because of their sovereignty states cannot be um, coerced all their acts are legal legal purists may contend that nothing is law which is not imposed from above by a sovereign power having um, the power to compel obedience that idea of the analytical jurist has never been applicable to international law and if it had the undoubted and as I understand here unquestioned obligation of states in matters of contract and of thought it could not exist it may be true that um, in international relationships prior to the war there was no super sovereign body which at the same time imposed international laws and enforced them but um, at least in the international field, the existence of law has never been dependent on the existence of a correlated sanction external to the law itself. International law has always been based on the element of common consent. And uh, where you have a body of rules, which, whether by custom or by treaty, which by common consent are obligatory upon the members of the international community, those rules are the laws of that community, although the consent has not been obtained by force and although there may be no direct external sanction to secure obedience. The fact is that absolute sovereignty in the old sense is um, very fortunately a thing of the past. It is a conception which is quite inconsistent with the binding force of any international treaty. In the course of the work of the Permanent Court of International Justice, it became a stock argument to rely on state sovereignty in support of the opinion that as states are sovereign, treaty obligations entered into by them ought um, at least to be interpreted restrictively. The court consistently discouraged that view in its very first judgment, a judgment given against Germany in the Wimbledon case. It rejected the plea of sovereignty as a reason for the restrictive interpretation of obligations in treaties. The court um, declined to see in uh, a treaty by which a state undertook to observe a definite line of conduct an abandonment of its sovereignty. The court reminded Germany that the very right to enter into international engagements is an attribute of state sovereignty. As a philosophical proposition, the right to contract and the right to freedom of action do, I, I suppose, present uh, an eternal antimony. But um, just as individuals secure their freedom by adherence to their laws, so may sovereign states maintain their own individual status. The view that uh, since states are sovereign, they cannot be coerced has long since been abandoned. The covenant of the League of Nations made provision as you remember in Article 16, for sanctions against sovereign states. Sanctions being only another name for coercion, uh, probably coercion of a punitive character. The Charter of the United Nations has followed suit much more decisively. It is true that uh, because of the absence of a competent compulsory jurisdiction, there is no judicial precedent for states being arraigned before a criminal tribunal. But that is equally true of the undoubted civil responsibilities of states, for apart from treaties, there is no compulsory jurisdiction in any tribunal to adjudicate upon. The first man tried for murder may have complained that no court had tried such a case before. The methods of procedure, the specific punishments, the appropriate courts, 
can always be defined by subsequent proclamation. The only innovation which this charter has introduced is to provide machinery, long overdue, to carry out the existing law. And there is no substance in the complaint that the charter is a piece of post factum legislation, either in declaring wars of aggression to be criminal or in assuming that the state is not immune from criminal responsibility. But um, then it is argued, even if the state is liable, it is only the state and not the individual which can be made responsible under international law. That argument is put in several ways. States only, it is said, and not individuals, are the subject of international law. But there is no such principle of international law. One need only mention the case of piracy or breach of blockade or the case of spies to see that there are numerous examples of duties being imposed by international law directly upon individuals. War crimes. War crimes have always been recognized as bringing individuals within the scope of international law. In England and the United States, our courts have invariably acted on the view that the accepted customary rules of the law of nations are binding upon the subject and the citizen. And the position is essentially the same in, uh, in most countries. In Germany itself, Article 4 of the Weimar Constitution laid it down that generally recognized rules of international law must be regarded as an integral part of German federal law. And what does all that mean? What can it mean, in effect, save that the rules of international law are binding upon individuals? Shall we depart from that principle? merely because we are here concerned with the gravest offences of all, the crime against the peace of nations and the crimes against humanity. The law is a living, growing thing. In no other sphere is it more necessary to affirm that the rights and duties of states are the rights and duties of men, and that unless they bind individuals, they bind nobody. It is a startling proposition that those who aid and abet, who counsel and procure the commission of a crime, are themselves immune from responsibility. The international crime does not differ from the municipal respect, uh, from the municipal offence in this respect. And then the argument is put in another way. Where the act, of, the act concerned is an act of state, those who carry it out as the instruments of the state are not personally responsible and they are entitled, it is claimed, to shelter themselves behind the sovereignty of the state. It's not um, suggested, of course, that that argument has any application to war crimes, war crimes stricto sensu. And as we submit that each of these men is guilty of countless war crimes, it might be enough to brush the matter aside as academic. But um, that course, perhaps, would diminish the value which these proceedings will have on the subsequent development of international law. Now, it's true that there is um, a series of decisions in which courts have affirmed that one state has no authority over another sovereign state or over its head or representative. Those decisions have been based on the precepts of the Comity of Nations and of peaceful and smooth international intercourse. They do not, in, in truth, depend upon any sacrosanctity of foreign sovereignty, except in so far as the recognition of sovereignty in itself promotes international relations. They um, really afford no authority for the proposition that those who constitute the organs um, of the corporate state, those who are behind the uh, state are entitled to rely upon the metaphysical entity which they create and control when by their very directions that state sets out to destroy the very comity on which the rules of international law depend. Suppose a state were to send a body of persons into the territory of another state with instructions to murder and to rob. Would those persons 
carrying out those orders be immune because in the fulfillment of their criminal design they were acting as the organs of another state? Suppose the individuals who had ordered the predatory expedition were to fall into the hands of the state attacked. Could they plead immunity? In my submission, clearly not. Yet the case put is exactly the case which occurred here. The truth is that this attempt to clothe crimes with impunity because the motive was political rather than personal invokes no principle of law but is based on um, arbitrary political doctrines more appropriate to the sphere of power politics than to that in which the rule of law prevails. And finally it is said that these wretched men were powerless instruments in Hitler's hands ordered to do that which reluctantly also they say they did. The defense of superior orders is excluded by the Charter, although Article 8 provides that it may, in an appropriate case, be considered in uh, mitigation of punishment if the tribunal thinks that justice so requires. But the Charter no more than declares the law. There is no rule of international law which provides immunity for those who obey orders which, whether legal or not in the country where they are issued, are manifestly contrary to the very law of nature from which international law has grown. If international law is to be applied at all, it must be superior to municipal law in this respect, that it must consider the legality of what is done by international and not by municipal tests. By every test of international law, of common conscience, of elementary humanity, these orders, if indeed it was in obedience to orders that these men acted, were illegal. Are they then to be excused? The dictatorship behind which these men seek to shelter was of their own creation. In the desire to secure power and position for themselves, they built up the system under which they received their orders. The continuance of that system depended on their continued support. Even if it were true that, as Yodel suggested, these men might have been dismissed, perhaps imprisoned, had they disobeyed the orders which they were given, would not any fate have been better than they should have lent themselves to these things? But it was not true. These were the men in the inner councils, the men who planned as well as carried out. Of all people, the ones who might have advised, restrained, halted Hitler instead of encouraging him in his satanic courses. The principle of collective responsibility of the members of a government is not an artificial doctrine of constitutional law. It is an essential protection of the rights of man and the community of nations. International law is fully entitled to protect its own existence by giving effect to it. <clears throat> Let me now pass to counts three and four of the indictment, the counts dealing with war crimes and what we have described, as in fact they are, as crimes against humanity. And as to these, may I first make some comment on the legal position? About the law as to war crimes, Little indeed need be said, because the law is clear enough and not in doubt. Here are crimes, more terrible indeed in their extent than anything which had hitherto been known, but nonetheless well recognized under the pre-existing rules of international law, and clearly within the legitimate jurisdiction either of a national or of an international tribunal. There is no element of retroactivity here, no question of post factum lawmaking, nor is there any shadow of novelty in the decision of the Charter that those who shared the ultimate responsibility for these frightful deeds should bear individual responsibility for them. It's true that the lawyers and the statesmen who, at The Hague and elsewhere in days gone by, built up the code of rules and the established customs by which the world has sought to mitigate the brutality of war and 
to protect from its most extreme harshness those who were passive non-combatants never dreamed of such wholesale and widespread slaughter. But murder does not cease to be murder merely because the victims are multiplied ten million fold. Crimes do not cease to be criminal because they have a political motive. These crimes were many and manifold. It isn't useful to catalogue them here. They vary most considerably in the numbers of victims. There are the 50 murdered prisoners of war who escaped from Stalag Luft III, the hundreds of commandos and airmen who were exterminated, there are the thousands of civilian hostages put to death, the tens of thousands of sailors and passengers who perished in a piratical campaign of terror, there are the hundreds of thousands of prisoners of war, especially Russians, and of civilians who met their death because of the rigours and cruelties to which they were exposed, if not by outright murder. And there are the many millions murdered outright or by the slower method of deliberate starvation. Six million of them for no better reason than they were of Jewish race or faith. The mere number of the victims is not the real criterion of the criminality of an act. The majesty of death, the compassion for the innocents, the horror and detestation of the ignominy inflicted upon man, man created in the image of God. These are not the subjects of mathematical calculation. Nonetheless, somehow numbers are relevant. For we are not dealing here with the occasional atrocities which are perhaps an incident in any war. It may be that war develops the good things in men. It certainly brings out the worst. It's not a game of cricket. In any war, in this, in this war, no doubt, there have been, and no doubt on both sides, numbers of brutalities and atrocities. They must have seemed terrible enough to those against whom they were committed. I do not excuse or belittle them. But they were casual, unorganized, individual acts. We are dealing here with something entirely different, with systematic, wholesale, consistent action, taken as a matter of deliberate calculation, calculation at the highest level. And so the principal war, tri war crime, in extent as in intensity, with which these men are charged, is the violation of the most firmly established and least controversial of all the rules of warfare, namely that non-combatants must not be made the direct object of hostile operations. What a mockery the Germans sought to make of the Fourth Hague Convention on the laws and customs of war. Convention which merely formulated what was already a fundamental rule, I quote, family honor, and rights, the lives of persons and private property, as well as religious convictions and practices, must be respected. The murdering on the orders of the German government whose members are here in the dock, in the territory occupied by its military forces whose leaders are here in the dock, of millions of civilians, whether it was done in pursuance of a policy of racial extermination, as the result of or in connection with the deportation of slave labor, in consequence of the desire to do away with the intellectual and political leaders of the countries which had been occupied, or was part of the general application of terror through collective reprisals upon the innocent population and upon hostages. This murdering of millions of non-combatants is a war crime may indeed be a crime against humanity as well. Both imagination and intellect, shattered by the horror of these things, recoil from putting the greatest crime in history into the cold formula already described in the textbooks as a war crime. Yet it is important to remember that that is what these crimes were, irrespective, in the main, of where they were committed or of the race or nationality of the victims, 
These were offences upon the civilian population, contrary to the laws of war in general uh, and to those of belligerent occupation in particular. And the truth is that murder, wholesale, planned, systematic, became part and parcel of a firmly entrenched and apparently secure belligerent occupation. That that was a war crime, no one has sought to dispute. But some attempt has been made to canvas the illegality of three other classes of action with which also these men stand charged. Deportation for Ger to Germany for forced labor, the crimes at sea in connection with submarine warfare, and the shooting of commandos. And let me shortly examine those matters. The deportation of the civilian population for forced labor is, of course, a crime both according to international custom and to conventional international law as expressed in the Hague Convention. Article 46 of Convention Number 4 enjoins the uh, occupying power to respect family honor and rights and the lives of persons. In Article 52 of the same convention lays down that services shall not be demanded from municipalities or inhabitants except for the needs of the army of occupation and that they shall be in proportion to the resources of the country and of such a nature as not to involve the population in the obligation of taking part in the operations of war against their country. With those simple categorical provisions we have to contrast the staggering dimensions of the operations which the defendant Sokol directed and in which the other defendants participated, the ruthlessness with which peaceful citizens were torn from their families, surroundings and employment, the manner in which they were transported, the treatment which they received on arrival, the conditions in which they worked and died in thousands and tens of thousands, and the kind of work which they were compelled to perform as direct helpers in the production of arms, munitions and other instruments of war against their own country and against their own people. How can all that be reconciled with the law? It seems to be suggested that the prohibition of the law of nations had in some way become obsolete in the face of the modern development of totalitarian war, requiring the vastest possible use and exploitation of the material and labor resources of the occupied territory. I confess, I don't understand how the extent of the activities a belligerent imposes on himself, the size of the effort he needs to make in order to avoid defeat, can enlarge his rights against peaceful non-combatants or enable him to brush aside the rules of war. We cannot make these post-factum repeals of accepted international law in favor of the lawbreakers. Nor is there a shadow of a right to invoke any material change in conditions as a justification for their crimes at sea, crimes which cost the lives of 30,000 British seamen alone. We need not base our case here solely on the violation of the customary rules of warfare as embodied in the London Protocols of 1930 and 36 fully subscribed to as they were by Germany, prohibiting sinking without warning. He need not, or even with warning, if, uh, if proper supervision, provision had not been made for the safety of passengers and crew. We needn't concern ourselves with the niceties of argument whether the practice of arming merchant ships affects the position. Nor need we take time to examine the astonishing proposition that the sinking of neutral shipping was legalized by the process of making a paper order excluding such neutral ships, not from some definite war zone over which Germany exercised effective control, but from vast areas of the seas. There is one matter at least about which nobody questions or could question the law. If you are satisfied that orders were given, that survivors should not be rescued, that steps should be taken to prevent the shipwreck from surviving, for the use of such weapons that there could be no question of survivors, you will have no doubt that what was done was contrary to law. It is no answer that to allow non-combatants to survive entailed greater risk to the attackers.
The murderer is not excused because he says it was necessary to kill the victim he had violated, lest he should subsequently identify him. So also in regard to the orders for the execution of commandos. New methods of warfare, new forms of attack, do not in themselves repeal existing established rules of law. The sanctity of the life of the soldier in uniform, who surrenders after the accomplishment of his mission, and who committed no war crime prior to his capture, is, and I ask you to say must remain, an absolute principle of international law. Those who, for whatever motive, trample upon it in disregard of law, in disregard of humanity, in disregard of chivalry, must pay the penalty when at last the law is vindicated. I shall not examine this matter further or detail the other types of um, war crime charged in the indictment. For that these matters, various in their kind or method, where crimes under established law is not in doubt, the tribunal will be concerned only to affirm the law and to decide upon the measure of these prisoners' involvement in its breach. Let me, however, before I turn to questions of um, fact, refer to the fourth count of the indictment, the crimes against humanity. It is um, convenient, I think, to deal with these matters um, together, for insofar as they were committed during the war, to some extent they overlap, and in any case they are interconnected. The war crimes were in their very enormity crimes against humanity, and um, the crimes against humanity were not seldom war crimes writ larger still. Moreover, the crimes against humanity with which this tribunal has jurisdiction to deal are limited to this extent. They must be crimes, the commission of which was in some way connected with, in anticipation of, or in furtherance of, the crimes against the peace or the war crimes stricto sensu with which the defendants are indicted. That is the qualification which Article 6C of the Charter introduces. The considerations which apply here are, however, different to those affecting the other classes of offence, the crime against peace or the ordinary war crime. You have to be satisfied not only that what was done was a crime against humanity, but also that it was not a purely domestic matter, but that directly or indirectly it was associated with crimes against other nations or other nationals. In that, um, for instance, it was undertaken in order to strengthen the Nazi party in carrying out its policy of domination by aggression or to remove elements such as political opponents, the aged, the Jews, the existence of which would have hindered the carrying out of the total war policy. Pursuing that for a moment, the racial policy against the Jews was, as I have said, simply one facet of the Herrenfalk doctrine. In Mein Kampf, Hitler had said that the most decisive factor in the German collapse in 1918 was the failure to recognize, I quote, the failure to recognize the racial problem and the Jewish menace. The attack upon the Jews was at once a secret weapon, an enduring fifth column weapon, to split and weaken the democracies and a device for unifying the German people for war. Hitler made it clear in his speech on October the 4th, 1943, that the treatment meted out to German Jews was closely connected with the war policy. Himmler said, for we know, and I quote, for we know how difficult we should have made it for ourselves if we still had Jews today in every town as secret sabotage, agitators and troublemakers. So the crime against the Jews, insofar as it is a crime against humanity and not a war crime as well, as it often was, is one which we indict because of its close association with the crime against the peace. That is, of course, a very important qualification on um, the indictment of these crimes against humanity, and it is one which is not always appreciated by those who have questioned the exercise of this jurisdiction. But um, subject to that qualification, we have thought it right to deal with matters which the criminal law of all countries would normally stigmatize as crime. 
murder, extermination, enslavement, persecution on political or racial or economic grounds. These things done against belligerent nationals, or for that matter done against German nationals in belligerent occupied territory, would be ordinary war crimes, the prosecution of which would form no, no novelty. Done against others, they would be crimes against municipal law, except in so far as German law, departing from all the canons of civilized procedure, may have authorized them to be done by the state or by persons acting on behalf of the state. Although, so to do, does not in any way place these defendants in greater jeopardy than they would otherwise be, the nations adhering to the charter of this tribunal have felt it proper and uh, necessary in the interest of civilization to say that these things, even if in done in accordance with the laws of the German state, as created and ruled by these men and their ringleader, were, when committed, with the intention of affecting the international community, and that is, in connection with the other crimes charged, not mere matters of domestic concern, but crimes against the law of nations. I do not minimize the significance for the future of the political and jurisprudential doctrine which is here implied. Normally, international law concedes that it is for the state to decide how it shall treat its own nationals. It is a matter of domestic jurisdiction. And although the Social and Economic Council of the United Nations Organization is seeking to formulate a charter of the rights of man, the Covenant of the League of Nations and the Charter of the United Nations Organization does recognize that uh, general position. Yet, international law has in the past made some claim that there is a limit to the omnipotence of the state and that the individual human being, the ultimate unit of all law, is not disentitled to the protection of mankind when the state tramples upon his rights in a manner which outrages the conscience of mankind. Grotius, the founder of international law, had some notion of that principle when, at a time when the distinction between the just and the unjust war was more clearly accepted than was the case in the 19th century. He described as just a war undertaken for the purpose of defending the subjects of a foreign state from injuries inflicted by their ruler. He affirmed, with reference to atrocities committed by tyrants against their subjects, that intervention is justified for, I quote, the right of social connection is not cut off in such a case. And the same idea was expressed by John Westlake, the most distinguished of British international lawyers, when he said, and I quote, it is idle to argue in such cases that the duty of neighboring peoples is to look quietly on. Laws are made for men and not creatures of the imagination, and they must not create or tolerate for them situations which are beyond endurance. The same view was acted upon by the Un European powers, which, um, in time past, intervened in order to protect the Christian subjects of Turkey against cruel persecution. The fact is that the right of humanitarian intervention by war is not a novelty in international law. Can, inter can intervention by judicial process then be illegal? The charter of this tribunal embodies a beneficent principle, much more limited than some would like it to be, and it gives warning for the future. I say, and I repeat, that it gives warning for the future to dictators and tyrants masquerading as a state, that if, in order to strengthen or further their crimes against the community of nations, they debase the sanctity of man in their own country, they act at their peril for they affront the international law of mankind. As for the principle which is, uh, the criticism which is made of retroactive law, that it makes that criminal which men did not know to be wrong when they committed it, what application can that have here? You will not disregard, even if these defendants, time after time, disregarded 
the countless warnings that were given by foreign states and foreign statesmen on the course which was being pursued by Germany before the war. No doubt, these men counted on victory. Their whole policy was based always on the notion of success. They little thought that they would be brought to account. But can any one of them be heard to say that if he knew about these things at all, he didn't know them to be wrongs, crying out to high heaven for vengeance? Let me deal first with what they did to prisoners of war. For this alone, the clearest crime of all, demands their conviction and will for all time stain the record of German arts. On the 8th of September 1941, final regulations for the treatment of Soviet prisoners of war in all prisoner of war camps were issued, signed by General Reinecker, the head of the prisoner of war department of the High Command. They were a result of uh, agreement with the SS and they read as follows. The Bolshevist soldier has therefore lost all claim to treatment as an honorable opponent in accordance with the Geneva Convention. The order for the ruthless and energetic action must be given at the slightest in indication of insubordination, especially in the case of Bolshevist fanatics. Insubordination, active or passive resistance, must be broken immediately by force of arms, bayonets, butts, and firearms. Anyone carrying out the order who does not use his weapons or does so with insufficient energy is punishable. Prisoners of war attempting to escape are to be fired on without previous challenge. No warning shot must ever be fired. The use of arms against prisoners of war is, as a rule, legal. Camp police must be formed of suitable Soviet prisoners of war in the camp. Within the wire fence, the camp police may be armed with sticks, whips, or other similar weapons to enable them to carry out their duties effectively. The regulations go on to order the segregation of civilians and politically undesirable prisoners of war taken during the Eastern Campaign. After prescribing the importance for the armed forces of ridding themselves of all those elements amongst the prisoners of war which uh, could be considered as the driving forces of Bolshevism, emphasis is placed on the need for special measures, free from bureaucratic administrative influence. And accordingly, their transfer to the security police and SD is given as the way to reach the appointed goal. That Keitel, who is directly responsible for this order, was issuing it with full knowledge of its implications, is made clear by the memorandum of Admiral Canaris, dated the 15th September 1941, protesting against it, and correctly stating the legal position. I quote, The Geneva Convention for the Treatment of Prisoners is not binding in the relationship between Germany and the USSR. Therefore, only the principles of general international law on the treatment of prisoners of war apply. Since the 18th century, these have gradually been established along the lines that war captivity is neither revenge nor punishment, but solely protective custody, the only purpose of which is to prevent the prisoners of war from further participation in the war. This principle was developed in accordance with the view held by all armies that it is contrary to military tradition to kill or injure helpless people. The decrees for the treatment of Soviet prisoners of war enclosed are based on a fundamentally different viewpoint. Canaris went, out, uh, went on to point out the shocking nature of the orders for the use of arms by guards and for equipping the camp police with clubs and whips. And uh, on that memorandum, as you were reminded this morning, Keitel noted, the objections arise from the military concept of chivalrous warfare. This is the destruction of an ideology. Therefore, I approve and back the measures. K. Any possible doubt that Keitel knew that the transfer to the security police and the SD was intended to mean liquidation can hardly survive study of that document. Canaris writes of the screening 
as it is called, of the undesirables. I quote, the decision over their fate is affected by the action detachment of the security police and the SD, on which title, underlining security police, comments, very efficient. Whilst on the further criticism by Canaris that the principles of their decision are unknown to the Wehrmacht authorities, Keitel comments, I quote, not at all. The parallel instruction to the security police and the SD recites the agreement uh, with the high command and after enjoining the closest cooperation between the members of the police, the police teams and the commandants of the camp, listing those to be handed over, it reads, and I quote, executions must not be held in the camp if the camps in the government general are located in the immediate vicinity of the border, the prisoners are to be taken, if at all for possible, to former Soviet Russian territory for special treatment. It is not necessary to remind you of the volume of evidence with regard to the numbers of Soviet and Polish prisoners in concentration camps. Their treatment needs no further reminder than the report by the commandant of Gross Rosen concentration camp, who on the 23rd of October 1941 reports the shooting of 20 Russian prisoners between 5 and 6 o'clock that day, and Muller's circu circular from the same file, which states The commandants of the concentration camps are complaining that 5 to 10 percent of the Soviet Russians destined for execution, are arriving in the camps dead or half dead. Therefore, the impression has arisen that the Stalags are getting rid of such prisoners in this way. It was particularly noted that when marching, for example, from the railroad station to the camp, a rather large number of PWs collapsed on the way for exhaustion, either dead or half dead, and had to be picked up by a truck following the convoy. It cannot be prevented that the German people take notice of these occurrences. Did any of these defendants take notice of these occurrences that could not be hidden from the German people? I go on. Even if the transportation to the camps is generally taken care of by the Wehrmacht, the population will still attribute this, this situation to the SS. In order to prevent, if possible, similar occurrences in the future, I therefore order that, effective from today, Soviet Russians declared definitely suspect and obviously marked by death, for example with typhus, and who therefore would not be able to withstand the exertions of even a short march on foot, shall in the future, as a matter of basic principle, be excluded from the transport into the concentration camps for execution. I request that the leaders of the Einsatz commandos be correspondingly informed of this decision without delay. On the 2nd of March, 1944, the chief of the SIPO and the SD forwarded to his um, various branch offices a further order of the OKW for the treatment of prisoners cap recaptured after attempted escape. With the exception of British and Americans, who were to be returned to the camps, the others were to be sent to Marthausen and to be dealt with under Operation Kugel, which, as the tribunal will remember, involved immediate shooting. Inquiries by relatives, other prisoners, the protecting power, the International Red Cross were to be dealt with in such a way that the fate of those men, soldiers whose only crime had been to do their duty, should be forever hidden. It was shortly after the issue of the Kugel order that 80 British officers of the RAF made an attempt to escape from Stalag Luft III at Saga. The defendants directly connected with this matter have not denied that the shooting of 50 of these men was deliberate murder and that it was the result of a decision at the highest level. There can be no question that Goering, Keitel, and probably Ribbentrop participated in this decision and that Jodl and Kaltenbrunner 
and if he did not actually participate, Ribbentrop were all aware of it at the time. Goering's participation is a matter of inevitable inference from the following three facts. Firstly, the order was given by Hitler. Secondly, Westhoff of the Prisoner of War organization of the OKW says that he was informed by Keitel that Goering had blamed him for the escape at the meeting at which the order was decided upon. Thirdly, in Goering's own ministry, which was responsible for the treatment of RAF prisoners of war, Walder heard of the order on the 28th March at the meeting of executives and told General Grosch. General Grosch informed Foster, who went straight to Milch, Goering's chief of staff, and returned to inform Grosch that Milch had been told and had made the necessary notes. You will say, whether you do not consider the denials of Goering and of Milch to be mere perjury. Keitel admits that uh, Hitler ordered transfer to the SD and that he, he was afraid they might be shot. He told his officers, Gravenitz and Westhoff, I quote, we must set an example. They will be shot. Probably some have been shot already. And when Gravenitz protested, he replied, I quote, I don't care a damn. On this evidence of his own officers, surely his complicity is clear in this matter. Jodl said that when Himmler was reporting the escape, he was in the next room, telephoning. He heard a very loud discussion going on. And on going to the curtain to hear what it was, he learnt that there had been an escape from Sagan. It is incredible in these circumstances that even if he didn't take part in the decision, he did not, at any rate, know of it from Keitel immediately after the meeting. And knowing of it, he carried on playing his part in the conspiracy. As to Kaltenbrunner's guilt, and the meeting at which Walder was informed of the decision was with Muller and Neber, Kaltenbrunner's subordinates. Schellenbrunner's, uh, Schellenberg's evidence of the discussion between Neber, Muller and Kaltenbrunner about this time on the subject of an international Red Cross inquiry about 50 English or American prisoners of war is conclusive. He heard Kaltenbrunner providing his subordinates with the answer to be given to this um, inconvenient in uh, and one cannot doubt his full knowledge of the matter. The reply sent to the protecting power and the International Red Cross by Ribbentrop is now admitted on all hands to have been a pack of lies. Is it to be believed that he also was not a party to the decision? That any of these men would have been prepared to take such a decision themselves or to comply with it if taken by Hitler is, as we submit, clear from the correspondence providing for the lynching or the shooting of what were called terror flyers. These documents show that neither Keitel nor Jodl had any scruples in the matter, while both Goering and Ribbentrop agreed to the draft order. You will remember the meetings which preceded that correspondence. First, the meeting between Goering, Ribbentrop and Himmler at which it was agreed to modify, I quote, the original suggestion made by the Reich uh, foreign minister who wished to include every type of terror attack on the German population as justifying action, and which concluded that, I quote again, lynch law would have to be the rule. At the subsequent meeting between Valimont and Kaltenbrunner, it was agreed that, I quote, those aviators who escaped lynch law would, in accordance with a procedure to be devised, be handed over to the SD for special treatment. And finally, Keitel's note on the file. I am against legal procedure. I quote, I am against legal procedure. It does not work out. Similar evidence is provided when we consider the attitude taken up in February 1945, when Hitler wished to renounce the Geneva Convention. Dönitz advised that, I quote, it would be better to carry out measures considered necessary without warning. 
and at all costs to save face with the outside world. A decision with which Yodel and Ribbentrop's representative agreed. Their defense that this was merely a technical measure and that they did not, in fact, intend any concrete action is disposed of by Yodel's memorandum on the whole question. I quote it. Just as it was wrong in 1914 that we ourselves solemnly declared war on all the states which for a long time had wanted to wage war against us, and through this took the whole guilt of the war on our shoulders before the outside world. <coughs> and just as it was wrong to admit that the necessary passage through Belgium in 1914 was our own fault, so it would be wrong now to repudiate openly the obligations of international law which we accepted, and therefore, thereby to stand again as the guilty party before the whole world. <coughs> After this, um, remarkable statement, he added that uh, there was nothing to prevent them, in fact, from sinking an English hospital ship as a reprisal and then uh, expressing regret that it was a mistake. Would that be... Uh, yes, uh, yes, Mr. Attorney. Um, would it be convenient to you to uh, sit at 9.45 in the morning yes, in order to finish? Sorry. Well, the tribunal anticipates that in those circumstances we might be able to finish at one o'clock or shortly afterwards. Yes, and I in any event, we would I sit on in yes. order to finish. I think I'd be very much obliged to, sir, to do that. And we'd sit at 9.45. Thank you.